Next in 11 at 11, the candidates face the voters seven days from Election Day. We'll have the latest on the investigation into one of the country's largest head injury care clinics. More on Dandy Nicola's exclusive look into Jim Coyne's book. Tonight, a threat from Erastus Corning. Chilly and dry weather for the remainder of the week, then cold weather for the weekend. Marty Aarons, Liz Bishop, Sports with John Brady, and meteorologist Neil Ostano. Now, live, 11 minutes of uninterrupted news, sports, and the forecast. This is News Center 6, 11 at 11. Good evening. We begin 11 minutes of uninterrupted news with what's happening tonight on the local election front. And with just seven days to go until the election, candidates are facing some tough questions from the voters. Ed O'Brien was in Albany tonight where many of the area candidates were on the hot seat. Ed joins us now live from the Albany News Center. And Ed? Marty, Liz, the big issue as far as the voters were concerned tonight was abortion. Not surprising since this candidate's forum was sponsored by an area church. <laughs> Candidates night at the Pine View Community Church, where pro-life candidates were easily gathering the most applause. I'm absolutely opposed to abortion under any circumstances except... <laughs> except where the life of the mother is in danger. That's the this was little more than an extended cameo appearance for Nolan, who said he had six functions to attend tonight. And he wasn't alone. Among others leaving early were incumbent Assemblyman Arnold Proskin of Colony and Ron Canestrari of Cohoes. Other current state lawmakers chose to stay and extend their comments to national issues. Let me say that I support President Bush. I think he's a key... Even if he marched in place for another four years, it's a lot better than having Bill Clinton march in place. The disco was clearly the star of this gathering, drawing loud cheers for his support of Bush and his opposition to abortion. But the ones who had the most to gain from this night were the third-party candidates, like Joe Sullivan of Albany, a state assembly hopeful. Uh, I'm the one that has 17 years sound experience uh, with the state legislature. But how much will a largely conservative crowd a week before Election Day be affected by what it heard tonight? It gave me a little more to think about, a little more to sift through. I don't think they changed my mind. I think the issues are very clear, though, with, the, with each of the uh, candidates. And that's the bottom line in forums like this one. The voters find out what they need to know. For the candidates, it's a process that will be repeated a few more times in the final days before the election, Marty and Liz. Which is one week from today. That's right. All right. A lot of people glad when this election's over. Well, I think especially the candidates right now. <laughs> that's what I thought, too. All right, said O'Brien, live at our Albany News Center. Well, there are a lot of questions tonight after federal investigators see quarters of the new medical health care systems in Massachusetts. They operate clinics for head injury patients around the country and in our area. Well, Marianne Worley has been following the investigation, and she joins us live now from the New Medico Center in Niskayuna. Marianne? Liz and Marty, the health department says that the New Medico here in Niskayuna and the facility in Troy were both investigated as part of the larger FBI probe. Now, tonight, Dr. Uh, William Reynolds with the state health department says that his office has been cooperating with the FBI for about a year now. He says his office has taken complaints about the facilities both here in Niskayuna and in Troy, but he does not know if the FBI plans any action at either one. Now, New Medico provides rehabilitation for people with head injuries, and the whole industry has been under scrutiny in recent months for everything from insurance fraud to patient care. So what should you look for if your loved one needs this kind of care? Well, Dr. Reynolds says first check out the surroundings for cleanliness. Second, ask questions about the kind of programs your family member will be getting. The, the, the family should be informed about uh, what the rehabilitation goal is for that individual, what kinds of therapies are going to be provided to, to meet that goal. Uh, there should be uh, periodic progress reports to the family indicating how progress is, is unfolding, and they should also be talking about discharge plans as part of the goal. Now, New Medico officials out of Lynn, Massachusetts, have been unavailable to talk to us tonight, but the company has said its uh, facilities will remain open and it does plan to cooperate fully with the FBI investigation. Liz and Marty. All right, Mary Ann Worley reporting live from this unit tonight. Thank you. You're welcome. Firefighters in Columbia County are mopping up after a huge blaze tonight. Flames ripped through the period Picks Antiques on Route 9 in Niverville. Owner Bruce Kalbacher tells us 
that he closed up shop just before 6 o'clock tonight and things were okay. But shortly after that, fire broke out destroying the building. Everything I bought and not sold in the last nine years. I buy and sell antiques. And Any idea how much is up in smoke right now? Work, labor, and money. Out-of-pocket money, uh, 100000 I don't know. I mean, everything I, I put in, everything I got, and uh, including myself. Everything except me is in there. Cause of that fire is under investigation tonight. Well, it's time now to update you on some of the stories we first told you about at 6 o'clock. Forest rangers will return to the woods near Indian Lake tomorrow morning looking for 60-year-old George Wolf Queens. The hunter has been missing since Friday. He's a diabetic and has been without his medication. Now, late tonight, a searcher who was separated from the other rescuers was found safe. A special thank you Running tonight for members of a local ambulance service and some good Samaritans. When Ray Rogers collapsed while jogging in June, members of the Clifton Park Passenger Ambulance Corps helped bring him back to life with CPR. Tonight, Rogers presented certificates of commendation from the county's EMS Council to the four members and the people who saw Rogers go down and began the life-saving CPR. As we continue 11 minutes of uninterrupted news, it's time to get the latest on the top national and international stories in our world wrap tonight. The discovery of what is thought to be a time bomb has canceled the scheduled speaking engagement by Democratic Vice Presidential Candidate Al Gore. He was to speak at Rocky Mountain High School in Fort Collins, hmm. Colorado. Gore was not at the location when the bomb was found by a student in the school's gymnasium. Israeli warplanes and howitzers blasted suspected guerrilla bases in Lebanon today. Radio reports say the Israeli army has moved tanks into the occupied buffer zone. All this comes after three days of increased attacks on Israeli soldiers and on civilians living along the border. Heavy rains and mudslides being caused by Typhoon Colleen are forcing scores of evacuations in and around Manila. Philippine civil defense officials say six-foot-deep mud flows are roaring off Mount Pinatuba towards towns and villages. Colleen is now heading for Vietnam. Well, it's time now for our first forecast, and we'll get that from meteorologist Neil Estano. we we'll put them out on the weather patio again tonight. How is it out there, Neil? Well, it actually is colder air temperature-wise than it was earlier this evening, obviously, but the thing that's changed, the winds have died down. Outside, we got uh, 39 degrees, and we're going to be seeing temperatures drop down a few more degrees, but really not all that bad. Tomorrow, I know I have lots of sunshine on here, but I think the clouds are going to hold tough for a good part of the day, so we'll be in and out of the clouds. High temperature low 50s noon time about 47 by 5 p.m. as you head out of work school temperature about 49 so more cool weather ahead and cold weather for the weekend that coming up shortly all right thank you neil okay. on now to uh, what we call first sports and sports director john graney is in the news center with the highlights how about it john what do you got tonight well liz there was no doubt in my mind that tony la russa did his finest managing job ever in leading the oakland a's to another western division championship the Baseball Writers Association of America obviously agree with my assessment as they named him the American League's top manager for the third time. La Russa got 25 of 28 first place votes and easily beating out Milwaukee's Phil Garner, Johnny Oates was Tito Gaffin fourth, and Mike Cargrove fifth. In New York, it helps when your defensemen can keep their sticks out of the board. The Islanders give up the easy goal in this play and lose to the L.A. final score of 4-3 to three as L.A. scores three times in the opening four minutes of the third period. In Glens Falls, watch the patience of number 14, Mika Avazov, who holds and holds and finally beats Jamie McClellan for the winning goal as Adirondack beat the CD Isles despite being outshot 36 to 17. Alan Vesey was brilliant in goal for the winners, who handed the Islanders their first road loss of the year. Elsewhere in sports, Don Baylor has been named to be the first manager of the expansion Colorado Rockies, and for you diehard baseball fans, opening day will find Montreal in Cincinnati next April 5th just 160 days away. We'll be back with more, of course, coming up in just a few moments. Now back downstairs to Liz and Morty. Okay, John, thanks. Time now to take a look at some of what you see in tomorrow's papers. The Troy Record interviews a father accused of burning his three-year-old son's hand. Troy police have charged William K. Smith of Troy with assault and endangering the welfare of a child. Smith tells the Record the incident is a big misunderstanding, that he heard his son scream, ran to the kitchen, and found the boy with his hand on the stove's burner. Tomorrow's Saratogian reports that Congressman Jerry Solomon has received nearly $50,000 in campaign contributions in a two-week period, all from PACs. That's political action committees. The article points out that Solomon's opponent, Dave Roberts, takes no money from PACs.
And tomorrow's Gazette reports Clifton Park residents will see a property tax increase of up to 16%. That because the town will lose up to $400,000 in sales tax revenue. The property tax will be raised to help make up the difference. And coming up in 11 at 11 plus, more of our exclusive look at Jim Coyne's Tell All Book. Tonight, Marty, a threat from Erastus Corning and the people that Coyne names in his book. The exclusive story continues next. This portion of tonight's news is brought to you by the Ninex family of companies. When Albany County Executive Jim Coyne was convicted in federal court, he revealed then that he was writing a tell-all book about his public life. And Marty, the book is at the printers right now, and our Dandy Nicola has obtained portions of this book. And Dan's with us now with more of this exclusive and very interesting story. Dan? Liz, Marty, people both in and out of Albany County politics have been holding their collective breaths, waiting to see if they are in Jim Coyne's book. Well, I've obtained some excerpts from the yet, yet unpublished book, and I also talked at length today with Coyne. But first, a warning. Some of the language in this uh, report could be objectionable. And questions that bother him so, Jim Coyne reveals a warning he received from longtime Albany Mayor Erastus Corning. It came when Coyne was about to back Ed Koch for governor. According to Coyne, Corning said, if you endorse that faggot son of a bitch, you will never again get a program through the legislature and there will be a war. I found him to be very, very much uh, not a fan of, uh, of Ed Koch and, and very, very much a fan of, uh, of Mario Cuomo. Did it shock you when he made that statement? Yeah, it did. Yeah, I didn't. I never expected him to say something like that. And, I, and that was really the first I had heard that type of accusation. Coyne also writes about the opening of the Knickerbocker Arena, a bittersweet part of the Coyne legacy. About the Nick opening, Coyne writes, it was the happiest night of his life and also the beginning of his downfall. And he also questions the amount of money spent by federal authorities to go after him. When you spend that kind of money, uh, and the estimates I've heard are 4 to $5 million uh, in three years, a uh, four-year investigation, uh, to look at every, pay, every check that uh, you've written, whether it's uh, to a uniform salesman or a sporting goods store, uh, that's an awful lot of work to to try to justify uh, the receipt of a defective used car and a $30,000 loan that was paid back. And when those indictments were unveiled in federal court, Coyne writes, after reading the counts, I put my hand on my throat, feeling for the hangman's noose. And Coyne also takes on a long-standing foe, the Times Union newspaper. Uh, there's a chapter devoted to the Times Union, and uh, I don't find them to be nice people. Uh, I never did find them to be that way. I don't find them at all to be uh, professional in their uh, in their business of reporting news. I think they're more of an editorialized uh, paper as opposed to a, uh, reporting the news. And uh, I get into some some very, uh, I think, controversial uh, items with regard to the Times Union and, and some of the people who work for the paper. And finally, was he set up by someone for the prosecution? I just know that there's a lot of uh, coincidence coincidences, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, things that happen that uh, deserve answers, and in many cases I don't have those answers, but I do have the questions. I want to emphasize that Jim Coyne is reluctant to show me everything that's in his book. He says he's afraid that if word more, of more particulars gets out before his uh, prison is chosen, he may be sent to one of the harsher run facilities. Still, he said plenty when we talk today. Tomorrow at 6? Jim Coyne talks to me about its preparations for federal prison and some choice words about the length of his sentence. A reminder, listen, Marty, that questions that bother him so is going to be due out any day now. Presumably it won't come out, however, until the choice of prison... I mean, if that... It's a fine line there. If it he is. won't tell you, but the prison isn't chosen and the book comes out, then it's all out. Exactly. It's a very fine line. But on the other hand, he would like to get it out before elections. He's afraid if it comes out Monday or Tuesday, every, everything uh. is going to be overshadowed. But he still is very concerned, very worried. It's, it's fascinating. I look forward to more tomorrow at 6. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Well, meteorologist Neil Sano is straight ahead. And what surprises does he have in our forecast? A lot more sunshine tomorrow, warm temperatures that does not look like it's going to happen. Forecast is coming up next. So we're going to see some sun tomorrow, you tell us? Some sun, not as much as I thought as, uh, that we'd see at uh, well, 6 o'clock. Well, I think some is better than none. That's right, that's right. It's going to be uh, on the mild side, but still below normal. 
a little warmer than we've seen the last couple of days, and probably maybe a degree or two. Oh, big deal. Well, today was another cold day. Temperatures only made it up into the low 50s. 52, the official high. Low 39, that's occurring right now. Still below normal, uh, 57. Our normal high for the day, it was another dry day. Right now, skies are mostly cloudy. Temperature 39, as mentioned, and humidity is standing at 82%. Could be some areas of fog and a few areas along the rivers and lakes. That'll be it. Pressure is rising just a bit. All right, here's what's going on across the country. The map looks a little different tonight because my computer is dead, but we came up with these uh, graphics from CBS. We do see some clouds over the northeast. They're hanging tough, so I don't think temperatures will hit rock bottom like they I thought earlier tonight. I think uh, upper 20s to low 30s across the area still on the cold side. Now, the current map is showing one storm off to our north and east, another storm dropping out of Canada, and behind this one, some real cold air, and that air is going to start to make it in here Friday and Saturday. It looks like it's going to hang around for Sunday as well, and I think we'll see some snowflakes in the air by the end of the week and into the weekend. Now, tomorrow, expect a, that storm to drop across the Great Lakes, some light snow falling behind this storm. gets closer to us, so Tuesday we'll see some clouds and some showers with this, and temperatures will drop after that storm moves out of here. It'll move off the coast, and then highs on a Thursday will start to drop off quite a bit. And then the really cold stuff moves in for Friday, Saturday, and the weekend. I'll be back with a forecast for you right after this. Overnight tonight, I expect to see a few clouds remaining. Low temperature 28 in the outlying areas. I think a few degrees warmer than that in town. Now tomorrow, you're going to be seeing a mixture of clouds and sunshine. High about 53, a degree warmer than it was today with a west wind. Tomorrow night, partly cloudy, not quite as cold, upper 30s. And then the forecast for the rest of the week, Thursday, expect some showers around, about 50. And then that cold air moves in for Friday, some flurries, showers. And then real cold for the weekend, highs only in the low 40s. North Country seeing highs in the upper 30s, mid-30s. So the weather phone number there, call it any time you want the forecast. And I'm sorry to hear about your computer. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. We're, we're all in mourning. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Fans are out in Glen Falls tonight for the renewal of the Northway rivalry. John will be along next to tell us who got taken for a ride. Reversal of fortunes on Wall Street today as the Dow Jones 30 industrial slipped more than eight points. We'll be right back. Well, John's not surprised as to the identity of the American League top manager. That was an interesting shot, wasn't it? Did you see that? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Boy, you would have been upset if it was anybody I'd have been else. Ticked off. I'd be roaring right now. The best manager is the one who gets the most out of the talent at hand, not necessarily the one who wins the most games. And Tony La Russa was handily the best manager in the American League in 1992. La Russa was the overwhelming choice of the Baseball Writers of America in winning the award for the third time as he led the A's to a divisional title despite a team record 22 players being placed on the disabled list. Red Sox fans can't believe the absence of Butch Hobson in the voting. In the National League, Don Baylor will finally get his shot at calling the shots. After paying his dues for a long time as a major league coach, Baylor has been named manager of the expansion Colorado Rockies. For the first time this year, the AHL's Battle of Interstate 87 took place at the Glens Falls Civic Center with the Red Wings playing host to the CD Isles. After a scoreless opening period, the Wings scored one second after a power play expired and got a goal from number 18, Chris Hansel, his 11th of the year as he beat Isle goalkeeper Jamie McClellan. The goal of the...